what I'm going to begin with is a bit of background in in migration and displacement. I, I imagine that what we need to begin with here is is some insight into the terminology that gets used to talk about migration and displacement because that will then allow us to think about how climate change is going to affect those different kinds of human movement that, that are described. So let's, um, let's begin with that. What I want to do first is just uh, show you um, some, some kind of basic migration concepts. Um, and the first one that I want to look at is this, is this difference between migration and displacement. And this is really key. This is probably the most important concept when we're thinking about people moving, is this difference, or if you like, this scale, this spectrum between migration and displacement. And the basics of it is that migration is a form of human movement where the people concerned have more choice about their movement, where they have more agency in their movement, where they are making decisions and choices about, about their migration. Displacement is the opposite of that. It's when people are forced to move. It's when they have very little choice about moving. It's about when moving is simply a decision between uh, is simply a decision about survival. And it's possible that um, this isn't like a hard and fast distinction. It isn't like two completely separate uh, forms of mobility. It's possible that uh, people's movement can fall uh, different places along this spectrum. So there are different choices that people have. It might be that they do have to move, but that they are deciding when they move or where they move to. Um, so we can imagine uh, different episodes of human movement falling at different places along this spectrum between migration and displacement, depending on how much agency, decision-making and choice people have uh, about their situation and uh, specifically about their, their, their decision to, to migrate. So, so that's, a really key, that's a really key distinction. And what we're going to do over the course of this of this session is look at how climate change uh, creates mobility across this spectrum. But we'll come to that shortly. Here's the second really key distinction. And this one's much, much simpler, much easier to understand. People can move internally. They can move within their own country or they can cross an international border. They can go into another country. And this is really key. And it's a distinction that I think is often um, ignored, especially when we're talking about climate change uh, and the kinds, of, the kinds of human movement that are created by climate change impacts. Because what we'll see as we go through this session is that although climate change, I believe, will create cross-border movement, um, at the moment, a huge amount of the human movement that's created by climate change is actually internal. And that doesn't mean that it is without problem. Um, it's just as important to consider the rights and welfare, health, mental health of, of migrants and displacees who move within their own country. Uh, but for all kinds of legal reasons, this distinction between internal and cross-border movement becomes very important. It's also really key to consider the different drivers of human movement, right? People can be forced to move or people can... Um, have their, their movement influenced by different forces. And those can be economic, like the labour market, people looking for work. They can be political, so political drivers of, of movement are usually considered to be things like wars, human rights violations, ethnic cleansing, the need to flee a particular country or location uh, because of who you are, because of your gender, because of your political affiliation. Um, so we have these kind of potential political drivers of, of movement. Social drivers of migration and displacement are often things um, like family connections. So people will often move to places where they already uh, have family connections or friends. Uh, so those social factors can make people's migration to particular locations more or less likely. And of course, uh, the topic really of this presentation 
uh, environmental drivers. And we tend to think of them as environmental drivers rather than, rather than climate change drivers because the way in which climate change um, creates human movement initially at any rate, is usually experienced by people as an environmental change. So we tend, to, we tend to label them environmental drivers, even though it may be climate change uh, behind those environmental changes, pushing those environmental changes. So those are, those are three really key things to consider whenever you're thinking about an individual person's movement, or whenever you're thinking about an episode of human movement. Is it is it more like migration or displacement? Is it forced or is it voluntary? Have those people crossed an international border or have they moved within their own country? And then finally, what are the drivers behind their movement? Are they moving primarily for economic, political, social or environmental reasons? Or more often, uh, what combination of those forces, of those drivers are creating them, their migration? So here's just a couple of quick examples um, you could, for example, have cross-border movement that is more like displacement and that is driven by a political force like a conflict. So I think, you know, a key example of this that's been uh, in the media a lot recently is uh, the Rohingya refugee situation in Bangladesh, right? So those people have been forced to move across an international border um, by an episode of ethnic cleansing, right? So that, that fits very neatly into uh, what we often think of as, as refugee-like movement. Okay, they've crossed an international border, they were forced to cross that international border, and the driver of their, of their movement was, was essentially political. It's driven by conflict and, uh, and ethnic cleansing. Here's, here's just a different example. Um, you could equally have internal movement <clears throat> that is more like migration, where people are deciding where and when to move rather than being forced to move. And it could be that the driver of that movement is primarily economic. So, for example, people seeking work or better paid work um, in another location within their own country. The reason that I've picked out those two examples is just to give you a sense of, of contrast. They both, they're both episodes of human mobility um, they both count when we're thinking about people moving from one place to another, um, but they're very starkly different. So I hope what I've done there is give you a sketch of some of the key concepts that we use when we're thinking about human movement. And what I want to do now is present um, what I think are going to be um, the patterns of climate-linked migration both now <clears throat> and, and in the future. And what I'm going to do is, is run through what, what the evidence shows us are going to be four of those really key patterns. And I'm going to use the concepts that we've just explored um, in order to shed some light on those patterns, in order to help us understand what's going on in each of those patterns. So the first one is, is displacement by sudden disasters. Okay, so what we're talking about here is people who are forced to move, right? Their, their form of movement is displacement. They have very little choice about moving. Moving is simply a matter of survival rather than a decision or a choice. And the driving force behind their, their movement is in, environmental in the sense that they are moving as a result of a sudden disaster. So. Uh, the image that you can see there is the aftermath of, uh, of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And I think the connection here with climate change is that we, we know with, with, a, with a good degree of certainty that climate change is already altering patterns of many types of weather-related hydrological disasters. So we know that climate change is altering the severity and sometimes the frequency of typhoons and hurricanes. We know that climate change is altering patterns of flooding, of river flooding, as patterns of meltwater change. We know that climate change is altering um, 
uh, storm surges which cause coastal flooding. These are all suddenly unfolding disasters and it's the suddenness of those disasters that makes this form of mobility more like displacement. Because when people have very little warning about a disaster, there is less time to prepare or do very much about it. And that means that their form of, my, their form of movement is forced, it counts as displacement. So I think this is the key, this is the really key form of mobility that right now um, should be of concern when we're thinking about climate link migration and, and displacement. This is, this is one of the key patterns. Now, when we have episodes of displacement like this, they tend to be internal and they tend to be short distance. In, in the aftermath of sudden disasters, um, no matter where they are in the world, whether we're thinking about Hurricane Katrina or whether we're thinking about Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines five years ago, or, or, or any of these episodes of, of a sudden disaster creating displacement, Usually people move within their own country and usually they don't move very far. And very commonly they move back to the location that they've been displaced from, uh, in the, often in the immediate aftermath of disaster in order to be part of rescue efforts or later in order to be part of uh, rebuilding and reconstruction. So people's movement is internal, counts as displacement, it's usually a uh, short distance and very often it's temporary. So that's the key, um, like I, I think the key form of human mobility that we are seeing now as a result of climate change impacts. And I appreciate that that is perhaps somewhat different to what we might, um, what we might imagine based on reading the media headlines. We tend to be told that um, climate link migration is going to create uh, refugee-like flows across international borders. Um, you know, we see headlines uh, more, more recently in the last few weeks about how um, the, the migrant caravan that is uh, currently in Mexico may have climate change drivers behind it. And that, that I think is, you know, that may be true. Um, but at the moment, I think the, the, the biggest form of mobility, the biggest form of climate link mobility that we need to think about is this, th this pattern of sudden, short distance internal displacement created by suddenly unfolding disasters. Okay, so that's, that's the number one issue, I think. That doesn't mean, however, that it's the only form of movement. The second one I wanna look at is this idea of, of mobility linked to the erosion of livelihoods. And this usually takes place as a consequence of slowly unfolding disasters. So what I'm doing here is drawing a distinction, which it's a very common distinction in the, in the literature about, um, about, about crisis and about disasters, is this distinction between slowly unfolding disasters and rapidly unfolding disasters. Okay, and this is, this is a fairly basic distinction, right? Rapidly unfolding disasters are things like we just talked about, floods, typhoons, hurricanes, um, slow onset disasters are things that unfold over a number of months or possibly even a number of years. And they are things like drought, water stress, and think desertification, and thinking specifically about climate change, uh, sea level rise. So these are things that um, don't, uh, they don't arrive with no warning, they unfold slowly, but they also potentially last um, for a number of years, or um, given what is happening with climate change, possibly reach a point where they are a, a permanent state. Now, these kind of slowly unfolding disasters, specifically like drought, create a very different pattern of human mobility. And what we see is rather than people being displaced, their, their movement is more like migration. Now, what I'm not suggesting here is that they have a choice or that um, they have absolute agency in their, in their movement, in, their, in where they go. But what I am suggesting is that when we think about this spectrum between migration and displacement, they, they are embarking on a form of mobility that is nearer, uh, nearer to migration, further towards uh, the migration end of the spectrum, than the people that I talked about previously, 
who move very suddenly. And the reason for that is that because these disasters creep up on us or unfold slowly, people have uh, some more decision-making power. They have a greater deal of agency. So for example, they may be able to decide when they move. It may be that they can make a decision about, for example, when, you know, which city they move to, which location they move to during the drought. It may be that they have a bit more agency about when they move. So it may be that they have a choice about uh, when, they, when they go. It may be that they have some decision-making power about who they move with, who leaves the area affected by drought from a particular household and who stays behind, which household members go and which ones remain. So this pattern of movement is, it's not freely chosen, that's not what I'm suggesting, but the people who engage in this form of movement have more decision-making agency than the people that I talked about before who were very simply moving immediately in order to save their own lives. <clears throat> so what often happens when we see this kind of, of mobility also is internal, right? When we see people's livelihoods being eroded by drought, usually what happens is people leave a rural agricultural area and they move to the nearest city in which they can find some alternative non-farm work. So this becomes one of the additional drivers of urbanization. It becomes another force that means that people are leaving the countryside and going to cities. So in a way, what we're seeing here is not necessarily a unique form of human mobility. Actually, what we're seeing is uh, many thousands of people moving from rural areas into cities anyway. And an increasing number of those people have a climate change dimension to their decision. Climate change has been part of the forces that have meant that they've decided to move away from the countryside and into a city. What we also see is people moving um, individually or in pairs, and this, this creates uh, both opportunities and problems for them. So a typical example might be a rural farming household realizes that over a number of years their farming livelihood has been eroded to the point where the farm can no longer support every member of the household. So then one or two members of that household will decide to move to a nearby city and find work. Now that creates a vulnerable situ situation for those uh, household members who have moved because it's very, it's very common that they are the the younger members of the household, they're moving to a city that they may not know that well, they are maybe exploited, they may be staying in insecure housing, creates all kinds of uh, risks for the, for the migrants themselves. But it also means that they are able to send some money back to the rural household that they have left. And that can help secure, create some level of financial security for the household that they've left behind. So it comes with risks, but it also comes with the opportunity to create this flow of money back to a rural area, which can actually help that rural family, the, the rural family that have remained behind, can actually increase their resilience to climate change impacts as well. So again, this is, um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to th necessarily think of these episodes of migration always as problematic. They also they can also create resilience, they can also create opportunities, and we need, to be, we need to be mindful that while we recognize the risks, and that they are often extreme risks that these migrants are taking, they may also be moving to somewhere that is firstly safer for them, and they may also be creating a level of security for the household that they've left. So, <clears throat> uh, the next form of mobility. Now, I've put this in a separate category because I, I think that it doesn't fit neatly into either of the forms of climate link mobility that I've just talked about. What I want to focus on for a minute is this idea of planned relocation. And this has become, in some ways, iconic of, of the kinds of migration that we think of when we think about climate link migration. <clears throat> 
You know, when we think about people moving, people migrating, people being displaced as a consequence of climate change, we very often think of the Pacific. We think of the Pacific low-lying island states. We think about those islands and those countries which are going to be badly impacted by sea level rise. And, and then the question of where those um, people go is often where our thoughts turn to first when we think of climate link migration. Now, lots of people in the Pacific are already embarking on forms of migration which are, are more like the, the livelihood erosion driven forms of migration. So many people in the Pacific are already finding that their livelihood is eroded to an extent that they can't stay where they are, but they are then using legal working and educational visas in order to, um, to, to go to places like Australia and New Zealand. And they are using that form of, um, of perfectly legal migration as a, way of, uh, as, as a way of taking themselves out of what is becoming an increasingly difficult situation. So I think the first thing to note here is that planned relocation or the idea of whole islands or countries moving together um, is not the only form of human mobility resulting from climate change that is happening in the Pacific. But nonetheless, I think it falls into a sort of special category of its own. And the reason for that is that the people who are engaging in planned relocations often have quite a lot of agency. They often have quite a lot of choice um, in the immediate term at any rate. It's certainly true that eventually they, they may have no choice about leaving from a particular island, from a particular location. But nonetheless, the planned relocations that are already taking place in the Pacific um, are often done with a great deal of very effective community engagement. You find communities um, embarking sometimes on grassroots driven planned relocations where they, they, they form groups in order to consider how they are going to move, where they're going to move to, how this relocation will happen, how they will continue to hold their community together as they, as they, as they take part in this relocation. They then perhaps engage with a government or an NGO that um, assists them in the, in the logistics and the legal practicalities of that, of that relocation. So this isn't a form of migration that happens in an emergency in the sense that we saw with the disaster displacement at the beginning, but it equally isn't a form of movement that happens in a kind of unplanned ad hoc basis that we often see when people's livelihoods are eroded. It happens in a very planned, very considered very organized way and I think therefore falls into a slightly different category of mobility uh, but I also think it's it's important to to highlight it here because it's one of the key forms of, of mobility that we will inevitably see more of uh, in the future as climate change begins to increasingly drive sea level rise. So some, some general points about the patterns of, of mobility that are going to be more likely and less likely. The first is that we're, we're likely to see more internal migration. We're likely to see more short distance migration. We're likely to see more circular migration as people move backwards and forwards between places as disasters unfold or as droughts arrive and then alleviate. Uh, we're likely to see people moving from rural to urban areas. Those are the forms of mobility that are, are most likely. Those are the forms of mobility that initially, at any rate, are going to be um, driven by climate change. They're the first patterns of climate-driven mobility that we're going to see. The forms of, of human movement that are less likely, and I should caveat this by saying less likely initially or less likely at the moment are these forms of cross-border movement and the reason that we're less likely to see huge cross-border movement is because if you can move within your own country if you can 
uh, move within your own country's borders in order to find alternative work or escape the immediate impacts of a, of a disaster, then it's far easier and cheaper and simpler to, to, to move within your own country and not cross a border. Okay, so if that is a if that is possible, most people will choose to remain within their own country if they can. Okay, it's less likely that we'll see mobility across continents. And that's kind of for the same reasons that we're less likely to see this cross-border movement. Again, crossing continents uh, is usually expensive and difficult. And if what you're doing is fleeing a disaster or simply seeking alternative work because your livelihood is eroded, if you can do that in your own country, then you probably will. It makes more sense to do that as near to home as possible rather than traveling thousands of miles to, to a different unfamiliar place. We're likely to, not to see this form of en masse refugee-like movement. I think um, certainly when people are displaced by sudden disasters, yes, that form of mobility can, you know, that, that's when we see those, the news footage of thousands of people uh, moving together from one place or another. Uh, to an evacuation centre or to a camp for internally displaced people. So in that sense, yes, that form of mobility is en masse, it is in large groups. But when we see people moving as a result of livelihood erosion, um, what we see is family members moving in ones and twos, individual people going, households don't move together, like let alone whole towns or villages or communities moving together. So I'm not suggesting that those numbers will be small, but it won't create that en masse refugee-like movement. It won't create those, um, that news footage or those dramatic photos of, of thousands of people moving together down the road. We're also less likely to see movement from poor to rich countries. And again, this is partly for the, the reasons that I've already stated. If people can move within their own country, they will. Now, that doesn't mean that overall, uh, in the future, we won't see an increase in the number of people trying to move from poorer to richer countries. If, if poor countries become poorer and if rich countries become richer, which at the moment, uh, regrettably, is, is, is the pattern of economic development that we're seeing globally, then yes, that inequality will drive people to move from poor to rich countries as, as it already is. However, my suggestion, my, my thesis here is that it won't be the direct impacts of climate change that, that drive that movement from poor to rich countries. Um, it, when we think specifically about the immediate climate change impacts, I think uh, what we're going to see is people moving internally, as I've, as I've already said. I'm not saying that we won't see movement from poor to rich countries, but I think the drivers behind that will primarily be economic uh, rather than necessarily the, the kind of immediate visible impacts of climate change. Now, I should add a, a huge caveat to everything that I've just said, because it is, of course, <clears throat> well understood that the impacts of climate change are likely to hit the poorest countries first and worst. It is those countries which are uh, primarily in the firing line of climate change impacts and it is of course those countries that are those poorer countries that are least able uh, to adapt because ad adapting is expensive. Um, it's those countries that have the uh, that already suffer with the worst infrastructure um, that are going to really feel the impacts of climate change uh, long before more developed, richer countries do. And to that extent, it is likely that climate change may well be one of the key things that holds back those countries' economies. So to, to the extent that climate change impacts are a driver of poverty, then I think, yes, we can say that um, that may add to uh, the number of people wishing to leave very poor countries and move to better off richer countries. However, what we will, what we'll see is not people who call themselves climate refugees. They won't necessarily be, they won't self-identify as climate refugees or climate migrants. We won't necessarily think of them as climate refugees or migrants. 
But nonetheless, for in the future, the, the people who move for broadly economic reasons from poorer to richer countries um, may have a climate change dimension to their movement because climate change may have been an important you know, an important force in, in holding back the economic development of the country that they are leaving. So, um, <clears throat> I hope what I've done there is, is give you an overview, firstly, of um, how, how migration and displacement are thought about within the kind of mainstream academic literature, the kind of concepts that we typically use to analyze migration and human mobility more broadly. Then I hope what I've done uh, is give you a, a sketch, an overview of the ways in which climate change is going to alter patterns of migration and displacement. What I want to do now is look at some of the potential solutions or interventions or uh, ways of, of dealing with this issue. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go fairly quickly through um, what are regarded as the, the kind of key points of intervention, the key things that need to happen in order to address climate link migration. Um, I think if what you're interested in is engaging kind of much more deeply in some of the policy arenas which are looking at climate link migration, then that might be something that we need to arrange a, a separate, much more in-depth webinar to look at. So what, I'll, what I'm going to do now is give you an overview and then perhaps we can, we can uh, engage uh, later if, if there is a desire to look in more depth at, uh, at any, of these, any of these policy interventions, any of these measures in order to address climate link migration. Okay, so the first and important one is emissions reduction. Now, this is an arena that we are already, I'm no, you know, I'm sure very familiar with. I'm sure most of our organizations um, have a, a very sophisticated, nuanced understanding of uh, how climate change can be, uh, can be mitigated through, um, through reducing emissions. And to an extent, this is really key um, in addressing climate link migration. But the key point that we need to understand here is that by reducing emissions, we cannot prevent climate link migration. OK, so I think there is a misunderstanding sometimes that um, if we fully mitigate climate change or if we make very rapid uh, emissions reductions, if we if you know, every country on the planet um, meets its Paris commitments and then more, that we might be able to stop climate link migration. Now that, I'm afraid, just simply isn't true. And the reason for that is even the amount of warming that we have already experienced uh, since, since pre-industrial levels, even the warming that we've already had is already beginning to alter patterns of migration and displacement. And further, no matter how fast we reduce our emissions, there is an amount of warming which, unfortunately, we can't do anything about because it is, it's sort of baked into the system, if you like. We're going to experience that warming no matter how fast we reduce our, our, our greenhouse gas emissions. And that warming will additionally create uh, further migration and displacement. So, yes, of course, we have to mitigate. Yes, of course, we have to reduce emissions as advocates and campaigners and, and experts in, in this arena. We are well aware of that and we know that we need to do it for multiple reasons. But it is worth saying that we need, we need to do it additionally in order to try and prevent future migration. However, by doing it, we are not fully preventing future climate link migration some of that migration, some of that human mobility is going to be, is inevitable. So mitigation of emissions is important, but it won't fully prevent climate link migration in the future. This is an extremely controversial um, topic. Uh, and the idea of uh, addressing climate link migration through more security measures 
is is you know really the kind of hot topic um, within this field and many governments approach to thinking about migration and displacement is already essentially a securitized approach um, it's not an approach that that i advocate or that we advocate as as an organization but we do need to examine it because regardless of what we think of it um, increasing security measures and militarizing borders is how most governments right now are thinking about how they deal with cross-border migration or irregular cross-border migration. And my experience is that when you engage with governments, when you engage with states um, about how they might address climate-linked migration, the first thing that they think, the first sort of suggestion that they have is essentially a securitized one. Their response, well, the response from wealthy developed countries, the response from most European Union countries is, well, this is a security issue and we will address it in the way that we address other security issues. And by that, they essentially mean the increasing militarization of borders and they mean intervening in the countries that our pe people are coming from in order to try and prevent them leaving those countries in the first place. This is, a, you know, this is essentially how um, European countries have responded to the migration and refugee situation in the Mediterranean. Um, they have scaled back the uh, funding that is available for rescue. They have simultaneously increased the funding that is available for um, uh, patrolling and intercepting uh, refugee boats in the Mediterranean. They have invested heavily in countries in North Africa, uh, in Libya, in Morocco, to try and create uh, migrant and refugee processing and holding centers in those countries to prevent people from actually embarking on the final part of their journey across the Mediterranean. So this is a, a kind of uh, an expensive and security slash military driven response. And many countries will look to this formula or this way of dealing with migra migration that they're using now as a way of dealing with future climate link migration. Now, this, I think, is a, is a mistake. I think countries, in doing so, are actually creating the crisis that they so, that they so fear. When we look at what's happened in the Mediterranean, actually, it's the fact that people um, have to make that journey in secret that they have to try and enter the European Union um, under cover of darkness or at a piece of deserted shoreline or to be rescued, um, that is driving them to make that movement in, in a dangerous way. If there were options for them to migrate into the European Union safely and legally, they would of course use those rather than trying to cross the Med in a, you know, in a dangerous boat or to enter via the Balkans sneaking across borders. So it's actually um, a securitized response to migration that, that creates what we usually think of as a migration crisis. Like when we see news footage of people in rubber boats, when we see the news footage of people trying to climb fences, essentially what's happening there is those people are trying to cross a militarized border. If you create a safe legal way for them to enter a country, either on a legal working visa or you make it clear that they will have their uh, application for refugee status assessed fairly when they arrive and you give them a way of arriving safely, of course people will do that rather than trying to enter a country in a clandestine or dangerous way. So the reason that I'm highlighting this here as a potential policy response to climate link migration is firstly because I think it's extremely problematic, but secondly because it is how most states are thinking um, about how they respond to, to this issue in the future. There is, however, also uh, a big role for international law. And the key reason for this is that at the moment, um, people who cross an international border as a result of climate change impact 
currently fall into this kind of legal limbo. They're not technically refugees. Uh, the 1951 Refugee Convention does not, uh, does not cover them. It may be that they don't fall neatly into some other category of, uh, of, of migrant. It's also the case that when people move internally as a result of climate change hazards, that the international law or domestic law and policy has not really caught up with their situation. So, for example, it may be that um, uh, a, a state that is experiencing an episode of internal migration or displacement does not have within its legal system the appropriate laws, policies uh, to, to deal with that. It may be that the international norms by which countries are supposed to uh, protect the rights of internal migrants and displacees may not be respected by those countries during those episodes of internal migration and displacement. So there is both a role here for um, improving international law to protect the rights of people who move across borders as a result of climate change, but there is also uh, an urgent need, I think, to ensure that states are updating their domestic uh, policies and legal systems in order to protect people who move internally. And it is also um, important that the domestic, sorry, that the international norms around um, the protection of the rights of internally displaced people are um, updated and implemented for an era of climate change, right? The, um, the, the international framework that protects the rights of internally displaced people um, has, been, it, it has been very important, but I think there's a question about whether it is really geared up for climate change. And if, if we think that it isn't, then what additions need to be made to that? And then further, what do we need to do in order to make sure that states are implementing those new uh, international norms? So there is a key role um, for law and policy here. I don't think that this can just be about security and I don't think it can just be about uh, reducing emissions. We do need to alter some of our international and domestic legal systems uh, in order to deal with this. Finally, I want to look at the concept of migration as climate change adaptation. And this is a essentially quite a new way of, of thinking about the issue. The idea of migration as adaptation essentially holds that for, for many people, um, adapting to climate change in conventional ways will not be possible. Uh, so when we think about conventional forms of climate change adaptation, I'm sure our thoughts turn fairly quickly to things like the construction of sea defences, the building of levees and dams that protect people from flooding and sea level rise. Our thoughts probably also turn to um, activities like switching to more drought resistant crops or improving irrigation so that farming can continue even during times of drought. But what we don't tend to think of as when we think of climate change adaptation is moving. We don't tend to think that migration can be a form of climate change adaptation. But what I'm suggesting here is that firstly, it already is, right? Lots of people are already embarking on migration as a way of coping with climate change. And they're doing that in a kind of homegrown grassroots way. They're doing it without the assistance of, of a government or some uh, international program. But the idea of migration as climate change adaptation says, well, given that we have limited resources to spend adapting to climate change, we, we know that there is not a limitless pot of money to help people adapt. We need to make sure that we spend that money as effectively as possible. Um, we need to help as many people adapt as best they can using the funds available. And it may well be that for some people, that money would be best invested helping or assisting them to migrate. And it may be that that money may go further if it is spent helping people move, creating jobs in places that are less affected by climate change, 
invested in ensuring the safety and the welfare of those migrants in their new location. That may be a more effective, safer, um, and more efficient way of spending our limited um, adaptation funding. Now, of course, the idea of migration as climate change adaptation is controversial. This is not an idea that enjoys broad acceptance by governments. However, I think that it is an idea that governments will have to eventually, uh, even if it is reluctantly, come round to because they will be faced with, um, in, in however many decades time, in, in perhaps 20 or 30 years, a situation where they, they either have to help people move as a way of adapting, or they have to deal with whatever crisis um, happens as a result of leaving those people where they are and waiting for them to be displaced, waiting for them to try and move on their own. So although a lot of what I've presented, I think, has perhaps been quite pessimistic, we've talked a lot about disasters, we've talked a lot about people being forced to move, we've talked a lot about the fact that governments will very likely try to respond to that in a militarized and securitized way. The idea of migration as climate change adaptation, I think, um, holds an amount of hope, should give us cause for some optimism. And my view is that this has to become um, a key area that civil society tries to engage with governments on, tries to persuade states that this is a safer, more humane way of dealing with climate-linked migration and displacement. So these policy areas pretty much bring me to the end of the formal part of my presentation. And um, I think now, um, with the help of the facilitators, if I can um, take some of your questions, um, that would be great. <laughs>